And joining us now to talk about what IQ tests miss, Maggie Toplak. She is assistant professor at York University in the Department of Psychology and the Faculty of Health. And we welcome you not just to TVO, but for your television debut. Thank you. We're very excited to have you here for that. <laughs> Here's something you, uh, one of your colleagues wrote, and I'm going to start by reading this out from Scientific American Mind. I coined the term dysrationalia, analogous to dyslexia, meaning the inability to think and behave rationally despite having adequate intelligence, to draw attention to a large domain of cognitive life that intelligence tests fail to assess. Although most people recognize that IQ tests do not measure important mental faculties, we behave as if they do. We have an implicit assumption that intelligence and rationality go together, or why else would we be so surprised when smart people do foolish things? So intelligence is what, and rationality is what? So intelligence, um, so I, I feel like I don't have to define it because I think it's something that everyone has uh, a lot of ideas about what it is. But in its simplest form, we measure verbal abilities, which is knowledge of words and, and general knowledge. And we also have what's called fluid abilities. A lot of these are, are measures of timed performance and how fast can you, you know, figure out certain um, puzzles and, and such. So we have very standardized, reliable ways of measuring this in, in psychology. And um, alternatively, rationality is not about these um, you know, speeded types of measures. It's really about how we make uh, choices and what are our natural you know, tendencies. It's, it's not about you know, being under time pressure and, and um, you know, not the same way as we measure intelligence. And again, you know, if you needed proof that they're not the same things, and we'll do this a little later in the program, we're going to give one of those examples, mm. and I've got to tell you, I flunked them all. Did you? Flunked them all. Didn't get any of them. Okay. And I think I'm a reasonably intelligent person, but flunked them all. Now, what is it about people, again, you think you get a high IQ, uh, you must be a very rational person, but what makes the IQ test not an indication that of a person is... Yeah, rationality. So I can give you um, lots of examples of how we measure rationality, um, but let me talk a little bit more about what we mean uh, by rationality, and then that will help us understand how it's different from intelligence. And rationality, there's two main components of rationality that we talk about. And one of them, so I'll use a little bit of lingo, uh, instrumental rationality. How good are we at achieving our personal goals? Okay, so for example, um, if someone's goal is to maximize their, their personal health and they go out and they buy organic lettuce and they read all the product labels for trans fats and then you find out that they're a smoker and binge drink every weekend. Well, that would be violating instrumental rationality. That wouldn't be in line with you know, achieving your, your personal goals. Um, the other type of, of rationality we talk about is what's called epistemic rationality, the idea of how well we track uh, truth in the world. So if we in fact have knowledge, we should you know, rely on, on the correct knowledge. I mean, I can give a bit of an example on that as well. Um, if you know, your, your physician says you have to choose between medication A and, and medication B, and the patient finds out that their neighbor had an adverse reaction to medication A, but then it turns out when you look at the data with many, many different clinical trials that medication A is in fact better, well, if, if you're going to um, follow the truth of the world and, and you know, follow the data, you should in fact still choose medication A. But, but people, people don't. People don't. Yeah, so these are examples of, of rationality. Here's an excerpt from New Scientist magazine written by Michael Bond. The idea that IQ is a poor measure of rationality is not without its critics. Christopher Ferguson, who studies the genetic and environmental factors behind human behavior at Texas A&M International University in Laredo, says that since those with high IQ tend to live longer and earn more, we should assume that intelligent people are more rational. They tend to have more knowledge with which to make better decisions, he says. Mm -hmm. You want to take issue with that? So, I mean, I think one thing that is particularly important with um, our, our work is we, we're not bashing the construct of intelligence. I mean, we're acknowledging that, I mean, intelligence has explained a number of different phenomenon in psychology and outcomes and all of that. It's important. 
We, we are not disputing that. All we're saying is that what people have called intelligence, we need to break apart a little bit and we need to add this other concept of rationality because rationality is not equivalent to intelligence. But are you prepared to say that there is a correlation or a relationship between intelligence and rationality? So sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. <laughs> That's very scientific of you, Maggie. Well, <laughs> we, we are actually developing what we call a taxonomy or a very big organized list of some tasks that are, are modestly related with intelligence, and then there are some measures that are completely unrelated to intelligence. So it just ain't necessarily so. The, way you look, the connection. It just, you that's know, right. Yeah. That's right. Here's where we're going to get to the uh, fun part of the interview. I'm going to read this test mm -hmm. twice because it's confusing. Okay. And people can follow along. Here we go. So, Michael, leave this up here a little longer, okay? Jack is looking at Anne, but Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, but George is not. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? And the three options here are yes, no, or it can't be determined. One more time. Jack is looking at Anne, but Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, but George is not. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? How do most people respond to that riddle? So I think you mentioned that the first time you did this, you, you didn't get it. The first time? The first time you did I, I, you, I read it. <laughs> in preparation for this, I read a, a paper mm -hmm. where there were four such questions. Mm -hmm. I got zero for four. If it makes you feel any better, I didn't get it either. That makes me feel a lot better, actually. <laughs> Thank you. I do feel better. And uh, we've studied this problem extensively. And it may seem like it's a bit of a, a parlor trick question kind of problem, but it very nicely illustrates uh, an important point that we've been making in our work. And um, What do most people answer? The mo so most people, so we have a number of versions of this problem. More, most people say cannot be determined. Right. Because we don't know whether Anne is married or not. Right. Okay? But... If you take the next step and think, well, what are the two possibilities here? Either Anne is married or she's not. If she's married, she's looking at an unmarried person, George. If she's not married, Jack is still looking at her, and the answer is still yes. So um, I, kn I know, I'm sure it must seem it. like a trick you question. Got it. <laughs> Tina, you got it right? I don't believe you. You really got it right. Well, because she's more <laughs> rational than I am. That's true. We know that every day because we work together. But the, the point that that um, problem illustrates is that people have a tendency to be cognitive misers. Okay? There's all, another term. You better explain what that means, yes, cognitive misers. All of us have a tendency to find the, the quickest, easiest, simplest way to solve a problem. And that option cannot be determined represents a bit of a, oh, you know, your first reaction is, we don't know what Anne is, so mm -hmm. we must not be able to figure it out. And it's, that's exactly what we're trying to illustrate with these types of, of problems is that, that we have that tendency. Some people have that tendency and some people don't. So some people do well on these types of problems and, and that's what we've been looking at is what characterizes you know, who does well on these problems. There's, there's always another trick question like, like how, many inning, I mean, how, how many outs in an inning? I don't know if you're a baseball fan, but they always Not ask really. people, okay, Tina, you're so smart. How many outs in an inning, Tina? What's the answer? Six. Oh my God, you, she got it right. <laughs> she got it right because everybody says three. Everybody says three. Tina said six. Mm -hmm. That's right, because mm -hmm. there's a top and a bottom of an inning. Mm -hmm. Very rational thinking. Uh, my answer was three, of course, because I just mm -hmm. I rushed to the finish line. Anyway, why do we do that? Why do we do that? Yeah. So everybody is a cognitive miser, OK? Everybody's looking for the easiest uh, solution uh, when possible. I mean, we can't overthink absolutely every decision we make in our everyday lives. But we also need to know when we need to think more and think harder about certain problems. And, and that's what we're out to measure. There's this other term, mindware problem. What's that refer yes. to? Yes. Uh, so that's the idea of um, we might have gaps in our knowledge. And uh, a perfect example of this, I, I love the gambling problem. So imagine I've just tossed a coin five times, and it's come up heads five times. And I say to you, Steve, what it, what's the next toss going to be? Is it going to be heads or tails? And what do you my think? answer would be, I have no idea. It's a 50-50 shot. Exactly right. You should have a 50-50 chance. Phew, I got one right. Okay. 
So I get the right and, answer. Uh, but a number of people will say, well, if you've had five heads in a row, it's got to be tails. And you could see how certain people might fall into this, right. perhaps people who uh, frequent the casinos, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, the idea of this is that perhaps these people have a mindware gap. If you truly understand probability, that there's a 50-50 chance, and that each toss is independent, you should, in fact, say the response that you gave. Hmm. How do you test? So, okay, we talked about IQ, and we know what it tests for, and mm -hmm. we know what it doesn't test for. Mm -hmm. Doesn't capture everything. How do you test for somebody's RQ, the rationality quotient? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So we've been giving that a lot of thought. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we're developing a taxonomy or a big organized list mm -hmm. of all the different kinds of rational thinking that we've identified in our work. And very similar to IQ, uh, we could develop a test that, that measures RQ. People take tests and buy exercise books and so on to improve their IQ. Mm -hmm. Can you do the same thing for your RQ? Sure. There are, there are books and things out there to be had? I mean, just all the, uh, I mean, as, as a researcher, uh, not as a, as a test industry developer, I would hope that people would train for this because that would mean they'd become more rational. So do we need to, I guess we, I mean, does it, the people who hire, mm -hmm. the people who accept students, mm -hmm. Uh, coming into universities. Do we need to completely change the way we've been making decisions about this over the years? If we're going to use something like IQ measures and SATs, we should have RQ in those measures as well. How do you make that? I mean, what you're talking about is a big cultural change in the way we approach a big issue in our society. So Absolutely. How would, you, how, would you do, how would you do that? I mean, the first step is just getting in people's minds that we've had this concept of IQ, and IQ needs to move over and make room for rationality. Hmm. Should we do one more? Sure. The bat and the ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. So how much does the ball cost? Mm -hmm. All right. And everybody, of course, jumps to the conclusion. They do the math and they say, OK, you subtract one from the other and there's your answer. And that, of course, is the wrong answer. Yes. You want to explain what the right answer is? Yes. So uh, the typical answer that most people give um, is uh, 10 cents. And uh, they have done this with students at you know, Harvard and some of these top universities and found that a lot of these students have trouble with this problem. And uh, they give the answer 10 cents, but if you... If which you, is wrong. Which is wrong, because if the uh, bat then has to be $1.10 and you add 10 cents, it sums to $1.20. So let's ask Tina, because she's on such a roll. Yes. Okay, if, the, if it's, if it's $1.10 in total, didn't you didn't get it. You didn't get You're it? You're human after all. I'm delighted to hear that. Okay. So but the, the right answer, answer is... is Five cents. Five cents, the ball's a nickel. That's right. Because? Because if you add a dollar five to that, it sums to a dollar ten. There you go. So again, it's an illustration. What, that's right. It's an illustration of uh, this cognitive miserliness. The first thing that pops into our head will give it as, as a response. I didn't get it either. Totally blew that <laughs> one as well. Maggie Toplak, it's awfully good of you to visit us today from York University. Thank you so much. and we. We always hope we're an intelligent program here, but today we also hope that we are a rational one. That so thank you good. for visiting us today at TBO.